I am Edner Sessi and Francis Levy and I are co-directors of the center. Uh, before we start today's meeting, I'd like to make a couple of comments. The first is to draw your attention to the art on the wall that was curated by Halle Cohn with the help of Adam Ludwig and it's called With or Without Permission, Appropriation, Assemblage and Collage. It relates to two future roundtables. One of them <coughs> is going to be a film on Joseph Cornell followed by a roundtable on Joseph Cornell and the other is a roundtable called The Lure and the Blur of the Real. Uh, since this is about uh, treatment and uh, talk therapy and uh, pharmacotherapy, I should uh, bring to your attention that that painting there, that work there, is primarily made out of pills. Uh, there, is a little, there is a little bit of a forbidden herb in it also, but the rest are pills. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, today's roundtable is the role of psychotherapy in the age of neuroreceptor, neuroreceptors and genes. Uh, Dr. Steinman, Ira Steinman, uh, is the person who uh, encouraged us or gave us the idea of this roundtable. Um, he has written a book called Treating the Untreatable Healing in the Realms of Madness and uh, where he treated a number of patients who were considered untreatable. And so we thought this would give us an opportunity to discuss the whole issue of the role of talk therapy in today's environment where uh, medication and uh, concern about uh, genes and so on have become so important. This gentleman here. And uh, so he uh, will now introduce the other panelists and we'll get going. Hi, everybody. Iris Steinman here. Nice to be here. We have with us on base Charlie Marmer, the uh, <coughs> new chief of psychiatry at NYU. On drums, we have Zev Levin, <coughs> who's the director of uh, psychiatric education and an analyst and a psychopharmacologist. And on trombone, we have Brian Kohler. And there's a long blurb about Brian, but most importantly, he's the president of ISPS in the U.S., <coughs> which is the International Society for the Psychotherapy of Schizophrenia. And I guess we're going to talk about the role of talk therapy, of psychotherapy, and by that I would mean dynamic psychotherapy <coughs> in the age of neuroreceptors and genes. I definitely think there is a role for it, and in my book I talk about how one can treat previously allegedly untreatable schizophrenic and delusional patients, and gradually through an inquiring psychodynamic uh, uh, wondering about what's going on with the patient, begin to make sense of things, and in the process people who'd been hospitalized for 10 years, people who'd been in and out of the hospital for many years, people who'd been delusional for as long as 50 years, were able to understand their hallucinations and delusions and gradually come off antipsychotic medication and stay off antipsychotic medication and get a life. So that's my shtick. And uh, we have some erudite people here who probably have some views on the topic of whether it's possible <clears throat> to do in-depth psychotherapy with very, very disturbed people. Um, I also think it's extremely possible to take even very depressed people and if one inquires into the origin of the depression, some people who are very depressed can actually come off medication, too. The old adage is one-third can come off, one-third need a reduced amount of medication, and one-third need to stay on medicine. So, guys, what do you, what do you all think about <clears throat> this topic? Well, since we've gone that far... <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. Uh, uh, I'm Charlie Berger. I'm the uh, recently appointed chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at New York University Medical Langone Medical Center. Before coming to 
New York, and I've come here with great pleasure and have wanted to come for a long time and look for the opportunity to come, which recently presented itself. I was the vice chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the medical school in San Francisco, where I also uh, was the chief of psychiatry at the San Francisco Veterans Administration Medical Center. So he, I have a he's great one smart cookie. There's no question. About well, I've had uh, bring to the to the to our discussion uh, some ideas about my own interest, which is in very severely traumatized patients, whether those who have been to war, those who are Holocaust survivors, or children of Holocaust survivors, those who have suffered sexual or physical abuse, and other traumatized populations. And the debate that, that Ira, and Ira's an uh, old friend, and he and I have had this discussion going back 30 or more years as the field has evolved, and it's a pleasure, thank you, to share this panel with you. And, and the other our distinguished colleagues. The debate about how to understand the relationship of neuroscience, neurobiology, neuropharmacology, and psychotherapy is, is, is the real deep and interesting debate of the time in our field. And the debate has become mature because we are finally develop, making progress in, in the relationships among mind, brain, and, beha and behavior. If you think about our, the field of psychiatry, uh, it has generally lagged about 150 years behind the fields of, say, cardiology or nephrology, uh, cancer treatment. And, and the reason is that, that, you know, the heart is a pump, the kidneys a filter, and the brain is at a spectacularly higher level of complexity and organization. organization. And we've not had the tools up until the last 10 or 15 years to begin to really understand how the brain and the biology and the neuroscience of the brain relates to behavior and to the mind. So this is this. I, I feel very optimistic. This is a very exciting topic. Uh, we are moving into the next 50 years will be the golden age of psychiatry because it will become the most important field in all of medicine in the next 50 years. Mental illness is in all of its forms. Uh, is highly uh, pervasive, it's very prevalent, and uh, compared to cancer and heart disease is generally more disabling and more profoundly affects people's lives. So we have an opportunity in the next 40 to 50 years to develop a, a very deep scientific understanding of how to integrate mind, brain, and behavior. And this panel today will be a chance to, to uh, to share in that dialogue. So that's, by, that's the framework through which I approach this question. I'm a researcher, and I am both a translational neuroscientist and, and a psychotherapy researcher. So I have a foot in both camps, and I'm excited about uh, having an uh, exciting dialogue with you about it today. I guess I'm next in line, and I have to be careful because Dr. Marmer is my boss. So <laughs> Do you want to I probably should move. <laughs> Um, I'm Zev Levine. I'm the training director at NYU. And I, I'm sort of here primarily as an educator because I see my role as teaching and training future generations of psychiatrists, um, as well as medical students who might not be interested in psychiatry but will be going into different fields of medicine and carry with them an understanding of the mind and the brain. So I'm personally trained as a psychoanalyst and work in private practice as well, doing a lot of psychotherapy in combination primarily with um, psychopharmacology. So I come to this um, with the idea that there is no question in my mind that talk therapy has an impact and has an effect. But the question is how and can we just tell future generations that it does and they're going to believe us? Or are we going to have to show them evidence that tells them that this is true? And it seems to me that what gets, what sort of, where we need to be is at a place where we're working very hard to show that what we do in talk therapy has an impact. Because if we just leave it to an anecdote or to uh, one or two people who say it works, we, we're in a bit of trouble. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. 
Well, I'm delighted to be here, Brian Kohler. I was expecting maybe 10 people, so I'm like, whoa. So I have some beta blockers I can give you, but we might not use them. Yeah. It's okay. I'll talk to you I, slowly. Always. <laughs> That's right. By the way, there, there are beta blockers on the picture. Which I'll have an uh, anxiety dream tonight. That'll do it. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted that there's so much interest in this subject. And uh, I, my first research was looking at um, hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin, and looking at uh, effects of psychosocial interventions on diabetes, and that was back in the mid-'70s. And I got hooked on this uh, psychoimmunology or neuroimmunomodulation model, and then which gets branched out into other fields. But um, I felt that uh, the impact of experience, social experience, what one Nobel laureate called the science of the night as opposed to the science of the day, which is objective neuroscience findings like what we would see on a PET scan or functional MRI or a MEG or whatever, how to integrate the two. And um, so from 19, roughly 77, 20 years later, in 1997, I wrote a paper that I gave in London comparing the neuroscience literature in severe mental disorders, which is what our focus is, I think, today, psychotherapy and severe mental disorders, comparing that literature, that research, with the, my area, which was the neuroscience of stress, anxiety, fear, uh, social isolation, social defeat, and I saw a huge overlap from 77 when all the neuroimaging stuff was really taking on and confocals came on the scene. And, and I found such a huge overlap between the two databases that I started wondering about, well, how much of the neuroscience of these individuals that we have uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder is really caused by social, psychological, psychobiological factors. And from 97 to now, 2010, I've still been tracking the literature. And I'm, I'm basically convinced that the lion's share of the neuroscience of severe mental disorders is a neuroscience of social isolation, loneliness, um, tra uh, relational trauma, but also um, social defeat. And where does psychotherapy play a role in that? I, personally, I, I think of psychotherapy as a psychobiology. We call it talk therapy, but it, it's, I, I, think it's, I think it was Jeremy Holmes who first pointed out attachment is the biological basis of psychotherapy, and neuroplasticity is probably the mediating factors involved. And now that uh, one of the fields I've been studying quite intensely for many years now, and actually proposed back uh, about 10 years ago that have become increasingly important in psychiatry is the epigenome. And if you look at epigenomic research, you could see that as a mediator be between gene-environment interaction. And uh, so I, I personally have become more convinced that psychotherapy, which is a bio psychobiologic intervention, which is a subset of uh, caregiving, basically. It's, it's concentrated, but... Uh, there's plenty of research showing how uh, caregiving uh, is mutative in terms of altering uh, uh, stress response systems, uh, fundamentally changing their uh, molecular organization uh, in terms of modification of the sensitivity and response bias. So um, I think we're, we are at a... Uh, I think what everybody was saying, I was giving a wonderful paper on his clinical work, what I just heard briefly here, we are at a very interesting intersection of disciplines. Transdisciplinary research is actually the wave of the future, so I'm really quite pleased to be here. And thank you for inviting me. Well, I guess the real trick is how to convince the young practitioners, or would-be practitioners, that it is in fact possible to take very severely disturbed people, people suffering from delusions and hallucinations, for example, <clears throat> people viewed as untreatable chronic schizophrenics or paranoid delusional disorder, 
and help them to step back and take a look at and inquire into their productions. First of all, to realize that they are their productions as opposed to coming from the outside in some way. And then for a person to try to understand their own metaphor, to understand their symbolism. That's the trick. I talked to the residents at NYU yesterday, and I, I felt that I was talking to deaf ears. I felt that in some way they have been so programmed or just expect that it's going to be the medical bottle and give medicines. And if these medicines were curative, great. But I would say, and I do say in my book, that I've been able to cure some schizophrenics. And by that I mean help them to understand their thought disorder, help them to go off antipsychotic medication. And some have been off antipsychotic medication for 30 or 35 years, living functional lives with relationships and work and stuff like that. Stuff that most of us would call a cure. So how do you get across to to young, idealistic, one assumes, residents, that it is in fact possible to do something more. So many of my cases are cases in which people have seen many other psychiatrists before and have been loaded up on medicines. And yet when I talk to them the first few times, no one has ever inquired into the meaning of the delusions or the hallucinations. And it's through inquiring that a bond is established and a little rationality begins to supervene and change begins. Zeb talks about the need for proof. I hate to think that I'm just telling anecdotes. I may be, certainly telling testimonials. But the question is, how could one prove it? I suppose I could have my patients do fMRIs before and after. That's a tough thing to do in clinical practice. That's a very tough thing to do. Right, and I think think the challenge, though, is to attempt to put forward a hypothesis and test that hypothesis out. And I think in this day and age, if we say it's too hard to do that, it's going to get lost somewhere. So I think, I, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure how one does it. But I do think that is one of the challenges in this day and age, is to demonstrate effectiveness of a treatment modality so that one can say this isn't just that I'm telling it to you. Right. Well, I can definitely demonstrate the ineffectiveness of the treatment modality for a great number of patients of loading people up on antipsychotic medications. And I've even recently begun seeing a couple of very disturbed people, one for 20 years, another for six years, in and out of all kinds of hospitals. The one for 20 years has had voices pursuing him forever. He's loaded up on three or four antipsychotics together in some cocktail that is enough to knock anybody out, huge amounts of each um, medicine. And when this fellow came in after 20 years of hallucinating and medicines being raised higher and higher and higher because he kept hallucinating, no one had ever asked him about the hallucinations. I took a little history. Lo and behold, he'd been traumatized, sexually traumatized. And in the act of being sexually traumatized, a lot of feelings came up. And lo and behold, this berating, threatening voice, and he'd also been sexually traumatized at knife point and threats of him being killed, his family being killed. This was the origin of the voice. So seeing this person just for six weeks and talking, not changing the medicines at all, suddenly for the first time in 20 years, the hallucinations are understood and the voices go away. My problem is that psychiatrists don't talk with patients. They load patients up with medicine. So for me, that's a gigantic dilemma. And in my book, I I cite chapter and verse of case after case where this has been the mistake, where psychiatrists don't inquire. Psychiatrists don't do what we all think psychiatrists do. Ask about what's going on. Try to make sense of what's going on, whether we've been co-opted by the... Big Pharma or not, who knows. But something has happened where uh, people by rote throw medicines, almost in a cookbook fashion, instead of trying to inquire and see if it's possible to to judiciously lower medicines or to judiciously uh, make sense of what's going on. So that's my my real dilemma. Something that, uh, there is no question that between the time I trained and the way the residents I see today, there's a huge difference. 
Uh, I sometimes supervise residents who really know nothing about the patient. They don't know anything about the history, and, and mm -hmm. if you ask them, they're surprised that you're asking them. Right. Now, uh, why this has happened, obviously, there's a history to it. But I wanted to uh, come back to something you said about effectiveness, because I think proving that the method of treatment, let's say psychotherapy, is effective doesn't tell you really anything else because it could be effective for a wide variety of reasons. <coughs> he mentioned some of them uh, which are very different from what I would mention as a psychoanalyst. Uh, so what the effectiveness tells you to me is not as important as I think what you were saying is that the answer to these problems and questions is going to come out of a better understanding of what we call mind and what we call brain and how these are related and interacting back and forth not just the brain causing this but how then the environment and the relationships and so on have the through the plasticity and through the epigenetic phenomenon and so on interact so i think that's where there is more hope than in these repeated studies of effectiveness of psychotherapy which is more i think a financial issue to get Re reimbursed for the method of treatment rather than the scientific problem. Yeah, well, but uh, the issues are very complicated. There's the issue of what matters, and there's the issue of how the field will uh, uh, move forward and how residents will be trained now and in the future, and how the field will practice. So while that we can have a philosophical discussion about what is the deep way to show that something's really important or not, the, the practicality is, as, as, as psychiatry moves dramatically closer to neurology and neuroscience, which is happening on a daily basis, future psychiatric treatments will be held to the same uh, uh, degree of accountability as, for example, advances in the treatment of Parkinsonism or uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. These treatments will only be accepted and disseminated if there is an evidence base for them. Now, the, the evidence base should be sophisticated and it should allow for the complex relations you're describing. Let me give one example. There's a very promising new behavioral intervention for the treatment of schizophrenia. And it has it, it, it's a technique which is becoming better known and is actually being broadly used in, in the New York City area in the public uh, hospitals, for example, at the Manhattan Psychiatric Center. And it's a technique that's developed by investigators in San Francisco and in Germany in which patients uh, with a schizophrenic illness are uh, provided with a series of neurocognitive behavior challenges, so it's a purely behavioral treatment. It is a non-pharmacological treatment, and it involves, in essence, uh, doing a uh, some sophisticated computer games to help with attention, concentration, and working memory. Now, this technique uh, is being tested by NIH. It's well-funded, and in fact, exactly as you were suggesting, Ira, uh, functional imaging studies are done before and after the treatment, and then outcome is also being and here's what's re remarkable about it. So far, the size of the benefit, or the so-called effect size for this treatment, appears to, at least for some of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which I think you were alluding to, the deficits, the lack of motivation, the lack of social engagement, the despair, the emptiness, the, the poverty of thought, which are very profound uh, disturbances in schizophrenia, separate and apart from hallucinations and delusions and thought disorder, that the negative symptoms of schizophrenia based on the initial pilot studies improved more, substantially more, with this pure behavioral intervention of a neurocognitive uh, attention to, to uh, exercising the mind in certain ways than they do to medications. Now, there's a beautiful example of a behavioral intervention which is becoming evidence-based, which is... Um, the intervention was designed based on our current knowledge of the neural circuitry of schizophrenia. So the brain science informed the behavioral intervention, and the behavioral intervention is producing large effects 
that are helping the lives of schizophrenics who are becoming more socially engaged, more active, more able to form friendships, more able to work, uh, less phobic, less isolative. Uh, so this is, a, this. A, I only offer that, that's, that's an example. So Ira, the work you do is, uh, is uh, highly creative, highly courageous. It's a, it, it, let's be frank about it, it's a very minority position you're holding on the treatment of uh, schizophrenia, but the fact that it's a minority position does not in any way invalidate it. The question is, how can it be studied and meet an objective standard? And for it to be, before resonance at NYU or anywhere else, could before Zev and I, for example, could agree to that to this kind of treatment you're advocating be part of the curriculum for NYU Medical School, it would have to be subject to that level uh, of... Uh, of behavioral and neurological analysis. What? That, that those are the standards we live with and that we feel are appropriate uh, for the field which is maturing now. With this uh, behavioral approach, does thought disorder go away? Do hallucinations go away? The, uh, 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 there is some improvement in the positive symptoms, but the most improvement are in the negative symptoms right. so far. I, I participated in some of this research and clinical work up at a state hospital I used to work at for many years, Rockland Psych, and we were connected with NKI. Yeah. A, a lot of issues were just raised. Uh, one is I saw the improvement in the patients coming from the extra time that was being given to them, the involvement of staff with them. When I talked to patients, they were, they were happy to not just be sitting on the ward looking at television, but to have someone actually working with them. Now this CRT, it goes by different names, Cognitive Remediation Therapy, Till White's group in the Institute of Psychiatry demonstrated that hypofrontality, which was thought at one time to be an endophenotype, of schizophrenia was reversed by CRT, and they're looking at it in terms of uh, polymorphisms now. But uh, Luke Chiampi, a social psychiatrist in Bern, did some research showing that once they reduce patients' anxiety levels, their neurocognitive function, the executive function, the working memory, Improved uh, from my perspective uh, as a neuroendocrinologically oriented psychobiologist. <laughs> once you lower cortisol levels, once you um, reduce the person's interpersonal anxiety and shame, you see uh, working memory improve. You see neuro executive function improve. See, part of the issue why I think psychiatry residents are not being trained in psychotherapy today is I've seen this from when I first entered the field DSM two days to now. We've moved from um, thinking of uh, psychiatry of the person, which the World Psychiatric Association is trying to nudge us back towards, to seeing these problems as proteinopathies, basically. The uh, thought disorder, positive and negative symptoms, all proteinopathies. Now, thank God, the epigenome is on board, and we're beginning to see that the demarcation from what we used to call genetic nurture, nature nurture is blown away, basically. So. Uh, we've adopted a cognitive neuroscience model, but there's a social neuroscience model that's very important, that's in the margins, that's becoming increasingly important. We talk about the circuits of the brain uh, in schizophrenia. Basically, we see them as uh, connectopathies, you know, regional in uh, the connectivity between different regions in the brain is the problem. No one particular region per se on its own, but how the regions are communicating. Um, you know, white matter, there's evidence for not just gray, but white matter pathology, you know, in terms of the inter uh, communication between hemispheres within hemispheres. But if you look at the areas of the brain that mediate social, like the social brain, the circuits of the social brain um, that have to do uh, with the kind of things that Ira's work is addressing, uh, that's very prevalent in our psychotic patients, uh, the, the, the disruption of the social brain. Uh, like uh, nucleus accumbens, the limbic system. I personally think it's more a problem in the limbic system than the prefrontal cortex. But um, if we could devise treatment interventions that address 
the deficits in social brain function. I think you'd see an improve, a downstream improvement in neurocognitive. But just one thing I want to add, as, as someone who's involved in ISPS around the world and has visited many countries and looked at many mental health systems, there is research uh, demonstrating the efficacy of psychotherapy with psychotic patients. Firstly, you have to think, well, what research matters today? The PORT study, which was just published in Schizophrenia Bulletin, uh, Anthony, uh, Lisa Dixon and Anthony Lehman, who we met after the second PORT study, their criteria is three RCTs, randomized controlled trials, because that improves internal validity of the, of the study, of the research. However, that's not maybe not the best way. Zev uh, used the term effectiveness. I think that's, that's a better way to go. RCTs is looking at efficacy. Naturalistic studies is looking at effectiveness. RCTs do not often represent clinical day-to-day -day practice. Randomization doesn't, using standard uh, protocols, manualized treatments doesn't match what often people are doing. It's much more complicated than that. So why not accept naturalistic studies? And you can boost the internal validity by using quasi-experimental research along with it. And that research has been done. It's been done in Scandinavia. It's been done in Italy. I'm familiar with many studies in Europe demonstrating the efficacy of psychotherapy with psychotic patients, both in, uh, in positive and negative uh, syndrome. But here, that research is hardly known. And uh, that's it, something that our group is trying to uh, change that situation. There are researchers in this audience. I see Yulia Landa in the back. She's a CBT. Yulia, could you raise your hand? Yulia is doing, now she's planning an early intervention study, uh, you know, the um, early uh, psychosis intervention research is becoming very hot today. But Yulia has been using group and individual CBT and looking at neuroimaging as one uh, dependent measure, looking at changes in the brain. Uh, what, about eight scans now or nine scans of psychotic patients pre and post? Ten scans of Ten. So this is a beautiful model of where the field needs to go in the future, right? It's really great. And this is New York, right? So this isn't San Francisco. So we can take off the white gloves and we can have an honest uh, uh, debate. <laughs> Someone just fell down. <laughs> must be somebody from San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was at a leadership retreat for a new, for a new chair of, at, at NYU, and there's a wonderful new chair of, uh, of neurosurgery there, and he and I were sitting together, and he's saying, well, you know, Charlie said, you know, this is New York, right? So when you get into a debate situation, what you should say to people is, I'm right, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask them. Tell them. So, so let, we can have an honest debate about it. Um, but as you can tell, Brian is writing a book on neuropsychological effects and the uh, chemical changes that occur in the psychotherapy of schizophrenia. And Brian has compiled a wonderful list of studies, which are in the appendix of my book, of the effectiveness of the psychotherapy of schizophrenia. Right. So, in fact, this work has been done, but it's not really thought too much of in this country. Well, that, that's, a, 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 that's another very important problem, which is if studies can be done, but if they don't get political and clinical traction, they'll die as studies rather than be translated into practice, which is, I think, a point you're making, Brian, about the importance between tr actual real-world practice versus kind of egghead academia uh, journal-based practice. So that's. A, but I wanted to come back to the point which you raised. You were saying, well, do we really need randomized controlled trials? And what I wanted to respond to was your first comment about the... Uh, the 
the cognitive remediation therapy is, well, maybe that can be explained by attention and interest in the patient. Now, that's a perfect example of why we do need randomized control trials, because in the studies that have been done of cognitive remediation therapy, the control groups provide all of the attention, all of the interest, all of the love and affection for the patients without the specific cognitive remediation. And so these different paradigms have their value. And, and our, we will have to begin with RCTs, but we can't end with RCTs. For I'd the like reason. to know the difference between the effect size difference between the control group there, where the uh, patients were exposed to more contact with staff, because yes. that's so critical, particularly in our state hospital populations, and the actual uh, active treatment intervention. I wonder how... So, so the effect size is substantial, <coughs> and the control is for equal contact and equal involvement. Well, we can share that literature with you. And, and I would just, if the gloves are off, I'm going to carry on here. Because <laughs> the sort of, there are a couple of things. One you said, and another you said. You had said residents aren't being trained in psychotherapy, and I, I don't think that's true. I think any... Um, sort of respectable uh, residency training program is exposing residents to psychotherapy training. However, it has to fall under the rubric, as Charlie had said, of an evidence-based, scientifically understood, or at least attempting to be understood model. Because otherwise, <coughs> what are you teaching the doctors who are going into the future? So I don't think that's true. And I think, as I understand it, Aaron Beck, what he did so beautifully was he put into play a treatment that whether one likes it or not, it can be replicated, it can be tested, it can be validated or invalidated, but it is, it is a kind of treatment that we can assess. And I think that's sort of a, a challenge to all of us to, to figure out how to do that. But I think another thing you said about this, the uh, measuring effectiveness, I think that's where, in some ways, psychoanalysts have historically gotten into some trouble, personally, in saying that um, we know it works. But <laughs> I don't think that, you know, there is meaning to something, perhaps, yes. But there is also symptom reduction, and I think most people come to treatment because they're looking to have their symptoms reduced. And there are a robust number of psychotherapy studies, and there's a fabulous article in the, Ameri in, um, the American Psychologist this in December, I think, Shedler's Shedler. article, which, if people haven't read, should really have a look at, because it, it's, it's a fantastic review of the studies that have been done, for better, for worse, that attempt to sort of assess, does psychotherapy work? And he takes it a step deeper with um, a guy named Weston, to try and also look at whether it works in terms of meaning for patients. So there are, people are attempting to do this. But I think um, when we look at change, mm -hmm. symptom reduction is a fundamental change that patients mm -hmm. are looking that for. That wasn't the point I was making. I wasn't saying that uh, we should forget about psycho psychotherapy or psychoanalysis being effective. I was saying that that, for me, this focus on whether psychotherapy or psychoanalysis in particular is effective or not is not the major issue. The major issue is understanding whether the psychoanalytic theory of the way the mind works makes sense as we understand more about the workings of the brain, the working of memory systems, and so on. That's what I was saying. Gotcha. Gotcha. This is a very exciting area yeah. for the future going forward. Very exciting. There is a question. There's a, we should put something else on the table. Because uh, uh, th there, is there is, to advance our field requires um, a pretty tough uh, position of neutrality on what can be helpful. And, our, and, and f every field of medicine and science is subject to paradigms. And the, there's been a huge paradigm shift away from psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic theory of the mind towards neurobiology and behaviorism. 
and the, there is some danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in this shift. And so, for example, I, I can speak best. I know much less about the field of the psychotherapy of psychosis. My work has been in the psychotherapy and psychopharmacology of traumatic stress, which as you were saying, Brian, is not unimportant for, and Ira, the case you gave was a case of severe traumatic stress of sexual abuse and assault and threat leading to a, a psychotic the level. The terrible part of it is that psychiatrists loaded that person up with antipsychotics for 20 years right. and didn't inquire as to the meaning of the delusions and hallucinations. And unfortunately, this is something that happens again and again. So we're talking about trying to get down to evidence-based uh, practice and developing new techniques, but there is an ancient technique, sitting and talking with someone, and as one sits and talks with someone and really inquires into the meaning to the person of delusions, hallucinations, bizarre, bizarre thoughts and phenomena, they tend and often do go away, and instead of someone being totally loaded up on medicine, as tends to be the usual practice, unfortunately it's the rule rather than the exception, um, people get better. So I but think this is... why they do. And oh, I, I think I, I have a pretty good idea as to why they get better. They begin to develop some left brain rational thought. Obviously there are all kinds of... Uh, Interjections that develop. There, I mean, I think I can be pretty clear about it. Brian can be pretty clear about it. But the real problem I have is why the field of psychiatry th just throws medicines at people instead of making an attempt to talk with them about the symbolic meaning of delusions and hallucinations. So it's great to get onto evidence-based uh, theories as to what happened. It's great to get onto evidence-based treatment modalities. But there is a treatment modality which, as you say, Charlie, we have thrown out. And it's not an either-or phenomena. One can use medicines and one can inquire. What has happened in the current practice of psychiatry in this country is that, for the most part, there is a total lack of inquiry and just a rote throwing medicines at people to such an extent that it's considered to be malpractice to make an attempt to try to understand things out of fear that someone is going to become... Uh, increasingly disorganized. So that that is obviously sticking in my craw, and it's an issue that I keep getting back to again and again. Not even so much for me, but because I've seen so many people who have been treated so abysmally, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. One person I took out of the preeminent psychiatric hospital in the country. They'd been there for 10 years. They were considered to be untreatable and told to stay there for life. They heard about what I do. I said, well, I don't know if I can. And one thing led to another. I took the person out of the hospital and for 20 years. They've been living out of the hospital, you know, integrating stuff. Uh, medications reduced tremendously. So my, uh, what, you, what you're all doing is wonderful. You're looking at the neurobiology of things. You're looking at evidence-based practice. Great. I'm saying the current practice of psychiatry in this country is a disaster when it comes to the treatment of very disturbed people. And don't forget, these are medicines that not only cause the antipsychotics, not only cause glucose and lipid metabolism difficulties, but Ray's study in the 2009 uh, New England Journal of Medicine, January, where he studied 275,000 records uh, in Tennessee, a study out of Vanderbilt, he found that there was a 0.3% per year incidence of sudden death of patients taking the newer neuroleptic medicines, the atypical antipsychotics. And at least in the study, and what Benedict Carey said in the New York Times, over 10 years, that's a 3% likelihood of sudden death due to cardiac failure. And if I extrapolate, if you take it for 20 years, you have a 6% likelihood of death. Now, this is something that people should know. People just shouldn't be given these medicines and told that that's all that can be done. More can be done even now. And I think that, take a look at your program, for example, there should be some attempt to just teach the residents, fine, use the medicines, but also try to inquire into what's going on. Try to inquire as to what these phenomena mean to people. 
As I said, that's my shtick, and it's it's something that just isn't being addressed. <laughs> I think it was clear in the beginning. This is this is what we love about. It's a great panel. It's what I love about New York culture, also. This is, the conversation is easier to have here, perhaps, than in San Francisco. Charlie, we've had this conversation culture. for thirty years. You and, you and I do, but you're a New Yorker, and now I'm in. What, what happens in San Francisco? But, 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 it, 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 it gets there's too much courtesy about the, these differences. There's too much politeness. There's too much of a reluctance to confront things very directly head on. So I, I, I was trying to make another point. Uh, Before I distracted you. No, 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 no. You're, you're, you, we'll come back to that. But I was trying to make another point. The point I was trying to make was, and again, I would like to illustrate it from the field of traumatic stress where I do do my work. Uh, first of all, with regard to the question, if we, t if we move away from the seriously mentally ill to PTSD and traumatic stress, which is no, uh, can be very disabling also to people's lives, but is not at the level of disorganization of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. But if we, in our field, there was a recent review by the Institute of Medicine, which, and the conclusion from the Institute of Medicine was the only definitely proven effective treatment for people with chronic severe post-traumatic stress disorder is psychotherapy not pharmacotherapy. It's behavior. So uh, there are several forms of behavioral treatment, uh, cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive processing therapies and some modification of those. But they are the only ones that rise to this, to this golden standard of the Institute of Medicine as enough data has accumulated to definitely say this is a safe and effective treatment. And while there are many promising medications for the treatment of post-traumatic stress, none of them have risen to that level. And what, so, about, what about dynamics like therapy? Okay, that's, that, that was the point I wanted to come to. Uh, there, uh, the conclusion on the field of psychodynamic psychotherapy for the treatment of understanding of stress disorders is there is not sufficient evidence to make any determination as to whether or not psychodynamic psychotherapy or psychoanalysis are helpful for people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So that does not mean that a, an appropriately trauma-focused psychoanalytically informed psychotherapy couldn't be of great value to someone who suffered terrible trauma. It simply means that it has not yet been studied sufficiently, and I, I was one of the people early in my career who began those studies, and they've not been completed. And the, the problem I wanted to raise was that, and in fact, I was approached this week by one of our faculty at NYU who um, uh, is, uh, works in the area of survivors of 9-11 and they are psychoanalytically trained, and they want to submit a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health to do a psychoanalytically informed, time-limited, trauma-focused psychotherapy for 9-11 related chronic PTSD, of which there's still a lot in New York. Now, what's the problem? We're going to try to do it, and I'm going to try to help this person get funded to do this. But I think it's fair to say that not, and I serve on the NIH committee, which reviews and sets priority score for the funding of, psycho, of treatment studies for schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety disorders. It's called the Interventions for Adult Study Section at NIMH. The problem is that it will be, this grant will not necessarily get a completely fair and equal review. So it would, this, if you submit a grant today to NIH, for a psychoanalytically informed psychotherapy of stress, anxiety, depression, or psychosis, it will generally be given a tougher review, and there will be more skepticism about it than if you submit a grant for the cognitive behavioral treatment of psychosis, or the cognitive behavioral treatment of, of anxiety or depression, or a novel medication treatment. So that that is a real issue for us. I think it's uh, it's a uh, it's a concern, and there really needs to be some way to adjudicate that because uh, I think I think psychoanalytic psychotherapy research should be put on an equal and fair playing field with other treatment approaches so Ira if you're going to actually get help through academia to 
validate the approach you're taking, and maybe it's not with all schizophrenic patients, maybe it's with a subgroup of schizophrenic patients who've had particularly brutal life experiences, that's a question also. But even if it's for a subgroup, to reach the same level of scientific inquiry, someone's got to be willing to invest in the work. To invest in the work, the work has to receive a fair, unbiased peer review for chances for funding. And that is a concern I have. I don't think at this, I think the pendulum has swung quite far against not not just the practice of psychoanalytically informed psychotherapy in psychiatry, but even the opportunity to demonstrate that it might be safe and effective. That, well, that is a concern. But Charlie, I would say that I've demonstrated it very clearly. Now, you might say these are just testimonial reports or anecdotes. I couldn't really argue with you about that. But what do you do with the evidence that I present in the way that I do? How do you account for the fact that these people saw many other psychiatrists loaded up on tons of medicines, all kinds of ancillary services, in and out of all kinds of hospitals? Nobody really talked with them to try to inquire into the meaning to them. I believe in the Chinese water torture method of psychotherapy. I keep getting back to the same things again and again and again. And I'm doing the same thing here. I'm trying, obviously trying to change. No, I was going to say, <laughs> as someone who's had the pleasures of being a victim of this Chinese <laughs> water torture at your hands for 30 years, I thank you for the gift. So I'm, try I'm, tr I'm trying to introduce, in, introduce for the fourth time another level to this conversation, okay. with, so. which is what do you do with the current mode of practice in the treatment of the severely disturbed. I agree with what you're saying about PTSD. The work you've done is wonderful, but the work that's done across the board, across the country, even at some of the best hospitals in the country, in the treatment of very psychotic people is abysmal. It's a shanda. There is absolutely no reason why people who can understand things aren't given the opportunity to do that. That is a deficit of the whole field of psychiatry in my very humble opinion. But well, I, 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 I just need to clarify that it's not that we haven't done this. When I was a resident, that's all we did. That's right. You worked in an inpatient setting, and you had psychotic patients, and you had psychoanalysts yeah. as your supervisor. Sure. And they got their medication, but you saw them two, three times a week doing uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Whether it did a lot of good, I don't know. My experience at the state hospital, and this is anecdotal, however, I don't want to just remain at anecdotal level because there is quasi-experimental research. I can name studies. What people is are a quasi-experiment? Where you're not doing <laughs> randomization, where you're not doing randomization, where you're not using a manual, where you're not standardizing the treatment like an interpersonal psychotherapy or CBT. It's, uh, psychoanalysis works against Occam's razor. I mean, the, the EB, e, evidence based medicine is really about narrowing the scope. And psychoanalysis, trauma and psychosis, one example from my practice a guy who became psychotic in Vietnam who would, uh, in his psychiatric residence, would put his furniture up against the door at night, every night. It was getting to be a problem. If the staff had to come in, if there was a health crisis, whatever, you know. They couldn't get in easily. He was barricading. He tells me in a, in a session he has a dream. Their hands coming through the door. After we got into what was going on, his experiences in Vietnam became very clear when he was given orders to kill people who were either innocent, you know, the Viet Cong didn't wear uniforms, so he, as a machine gunner, had to shoot whoever was running across the rice field. He had tremendous guilt, and he thought these were the people coming back to haunt him, to get him for what he did. Now, that, a psychoanalytic approach got there, However, if you weren't open to that and open to hearing his dreams and, and what I was talking about, sitting with patients for long periods of time and listening and listening to yourself and listening. Sometimes not even that long. This was long. Uh, I, <laughs> it was long. It was long. It took a while. It took a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> we, we, we will return to a rational now if I get a feature day. What do you do when you put four comics in a room in front of a microphone? Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. You know, when, it's a high when, level of uh, shirms. Shirms. <laughs> stick level here. But. When, when you talk, Ira, though, about the field, I, I think perhaps um, where we're at with people who've been in practice for a long time is one thing. But I, I think most residents who come into training are as equally altruistic and as hopeful about this as we were. And, and I don't believe they're throwing medicines at people because they're trying to damage anyone. I think no. what they're trying to do is help. And as you say, they're looking to, well, what helps? And when you were trained, it's unclear that that helped. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't help. I keep, I'm saying the same thing over again as well, which is also water torture. <laughs> but unless we, it That's can't, a good discussion. it just can't be enough for you to say this, it worked with these patients because what worked? How did it work? Who, is it something well, about you? Is there something that you're doing that could be taught to a future generation to do in the same way? What is going on in the brain when this is happening is, a, is another level of looking at it. L but I, Luckily, I'm, Zeb, all the answers to your questions are contained in my book, which I hope you read. <laughs> Secure attachment. I think, you know, with our psychotic patients, they're not so different. Danny Weinberger, many years ago, you probably know the article, uh, his classic article on neurodevelopment and schizophrenia, he, he uh, speculates an unlikely scenario, was uh, unlikely, he used the word unlikely, that schizophrenia may not be an illness at all, it may be extreme variation. And uh, that some people, 1% or 0.5% of the population falls into uh, because of uh, multiple genes, perhaps a thousand, uh, multiple environmental risk factors. But um, this is this model. I think the model that we have of what goes wrong, uh, we're, in, we're in the dark about it, right? We don't know. No, no candidate genes have really had. Uh, you know, high odds ratios. In fact, some environmental factors like urban birth, urban living, migration have higher odds ratios than uh, like uh, what? Disrupted in schizophrenia gene or neuregulin or some of the others. There's many on the, on the scene now. But um, how I, I agree with you. I think residents, you know, we shouldn't, analysts should not take the view that, uh, you know, it's the evil empire, the, uh, people who are using medicine, <laughs> because I, I do think that they are trying their best. I think they're lacking information, and I think that's part of the problem in the field. Um, if you fall back on physical, chemical explanations for things without really exploring the depths of the symptoms and the life history of the patient. You're losing vital information that you could use to help the patient. And I think that's a part of the problem in, in the field today. And what does that require? We're going back to time. It takes a lot of time. You have to sit with patients. It, it took one of my patients from the state hospital. He's out of the state hospital. What I wanted to say anecdotally, most of the patients I observed who got psychotherapy at the state hospital, the ones that I were, was able to follow over the last 15 years, never had to return to the state hospital. It took one patient six years before he told me a dream, a dream fragment. I didn't ask him for dreams. It takes time to help people. And I think one of the things that maybe I is doing, that you're doing, any, any good clinician is doing, is creating a secure attachment, which we know from research helps people's affect regulation. Yeah. And that's what a lot of the models center on today, affect regulation, yes. whether it's negative symptoms or positive symptoms. Brian, isn't, would economics then be a factor in this whole thing? Well, we calculated, actually, some of the patients, how much money we were saving the state by the patients who got out and didn't have to get back. Prior to psychotherapy, they get discharged, they'd fall through the cracks, they would do things to get themselves rehospitalized via Bellevue back to Rockland. And the patients who had simple psychotherapy, you don't have to be a, a, an analyst, actually, to provide this kind of work. You could have good supervision. 
We saved the state hospital. We saved the OMH quite a bit of money. He said it took six years to get the dream. That that's someone else. He got out of the hospital way before he told me a dream. There's, I mean, the financial aspect, of course, is part of it. But from the beginning, I've seen a number of people for nothing, and about. Are you available now? <laughs> <laughs> about four or five, about four, about four years ago, everybody, right. everybody's, everybody's a comedian here. All right. About, about four sure. years I have, ago, I have Dr. Simon's card available for anyone who would like high quality free care. About four years ago, somebody uh, contacted me, a very distraught young girl, university student, and I could see that the family couldn't afford anything, so we didn't even talk about money. And this person was cutting, suicidal, hallucinating, you name it. And I began to see this person every day. And after a few weeks, the father gave me a check for what he could afford. And I was delighted, and I didn't think anything. I said, well, this, this is going to be someone whose life I'll try to help and see what I can do here, because this just seems necessary. And the person was able to stay out of the hospital for longer and longer. And then the father says, you know, the ins there is insurance. I said, I haven't taken insurance in many years. He said, well, they want to talk with you. So I said, I really don't want to talk with them. He said, no, 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 they, they really want to talk with you. So having dealt with insurance companies 25, 30 years earlier, I got, as you can tell, girded and got very aggressive. I'm like, eh, what do you want or something like that? And the guy said, no, 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 we've heard what you do. You're saving us so much money by seeing this person. We'll be glad to pay your usual fee. If you'll take a little less, we'd be delighted. But this will save us a tremendous amount of money. And for the next year and a half, until the patient was better, they were true to their word. Recently, the same thing has happened from a big uh, health uh, concern where they've contacted me to look after someone because uh, this person was just bouncing in and out of their facilities again and again. So between looking after people on your own dime and trusting in some kind of karmic recompense, things seem to work out for this kind of in-depth uh, approach. Although I do think, I, I do think in reality, economics pays. I mean, it plays a, a huge role because yeah. patients are brought into an emergency mm -hmm. room as soon as they're brought there. The resident is contemplating what is their mm -hmm. discharge plan. Mm -hmm. it, it just is a is a reality, and being able to give someone medication that would work is a much right. more well, this immediate. Is, this sort is of so different reduction. from the way we were trained yeah. 35, 40 years ago. Yeah. Where you'd spend time with people. If someone came in the emergency room, it'd usually be a quite a long period of time. They'd come in the hospital. We'd sit with them spend time with them, get to know what was going on. Right, and in today's day and age, there are laws about how long you can keep someone in an emergency room. Yeah. And within a certain number of hours, someone has to be sent right. to another level of care. So yeah. I think that has a very big impact on the relationship that you can form. Yeah. Well, what you and Charles, Zev and Charles brought up was uh, something we, we've kind of circled around. But besides the economics and the practical and the research and the importance of RTCs, what are the factors that mediate therapeutic change? If we could uh, present evidence that psychotherapy can reduce both positive and negative symptoms effectively over time, what are the mediating variables? When, when Ira was giving his talk down at NYU about a couple hours ago, I had a theory that popped in my mind Based on Kapoor's work, Shichi uh, Kapoor about uh, how do uh, dopaminergic agents work, how do the second, third, gen first generation included agents work. His, he was trying to link biology and psychology, biology and phenomenology, and he proposed a theory that it works by reducing salience, right? that the person still has the voice, the person still may even have the delusions. They're not paying to it. They're more indifferent. That's one of the accepted models today. So maybe what Ira is doing and other people, like yourselves who are working with psychotic patients and getting into what happened to them and talking about their experience, you're shifting their their focus, what, what you're doing is you're shifting the focus away from uh, the colorful symptomatology of the psychosis, whatever it is, to conflicts in their life, conflicts in their past life, 
conflicts in the relationship with the therapist. So you're shifting the salience away, and they're not. And I've seen this with patients. They're, they're hallucinating during the session. Mm-hmm. They're spending more time and energy with their voice than with me. Mm-hmm. And over time, you see reduction of that and more capacity to relate without feeling like they're going to hurt you or be hurt by you. So maybe that's part of it. However, there's many, obviously, it's complicated. There's many other changes taking place. And I think eventually what we're going to see as our tools get better is that when you're establishing secure attachments and relationships with people, if you look at the social neuroscience research of people like Douglas Meany, whose work has great import for psychiatry up at Douglas Hospital Center at McGill. Michael Meany. Yeah, Yeah, Michael Meany. He was here. Pardon me? You had a, uh, his, his work is very important in the epigenetics work. Very, yeah. Very, very important. Yeah. Very important for trauma, especially. Yeah. He sh- I mean, they've in the transcriptome, and they've looked at 900 genes that are operating in the hippocampus alone that are significantly modified by maternal care. And, and therefore social experience. But his research on licking, grooming, archback nursing, which is hitting the popular press now, has some import for our understandings of therapeutic actions. In brief, one of the things that we've learned is that if you establish a secure attachment with mammals, with human beings certainly, your genome is, is overlapping with mammals, you're creating more glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus alone. That's soaking up cortisol, neuroprotective, and therefore you're, you're helping the person with their stress reactivity from a, from a social intervention. I, I think residents really need to know and, and certainly psychology in terms as well. We, we're focusing on residents, but this is not just with psychiatry. This is in psychology and social work. And I hear the same stuff from other disciplines as well. It's interesting. Uh, I was thinking also, because I, uh, Ira, Ira and I have had a chance to talk a little bit after you've presented your cases from your book and so on. And I've also been very interested to know what, what would be the mechanism of change and how we understand it. And some of the work that's the, uh, being done in the neuroscience of, uh, this, of fear, how fear is learned and how fear is unlearned and how fearful memories are subject to change and modulation may be very relevant to this because obviously in, in the inner world of a person who's suffering from from a psychotic illness is is a, is a, a very frightening and a, t- a terrifying place, and so how to how to change that, especially if there's been brutal trauma early in life. So one one of the things we had a meeting yesterday while you were presenting yesterday at NYU, we had a meeting, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there for it because we had a meeting on on. Um, new models of understanding fear acquisition and how people overcome fear. One of the most important things from animal models and from psychotherapy studies of helping people master fear, I'm not talking about the fear of psychosis, just deep anxieties, is that we have learned in the last 10 years from animals and humans Mm -hmm. that memories which are attached to fearful experiences are not engraved in a permanent way. And that when memories are accessed through psychotherapy and are brought out and examined, uh, that the memories uh, are subject to change before they are restored in long-term memory again. So in essence, one opens the drawer of memory, takes out painful, fearful memories, modulates that through the human experience of discourse and psychotherapy. That's exactly right. And, 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 and what gets reconsolidated or put back into the memory drawer is an altered experience of what occurred in the past with less terror, horror, and helplessness attached to it. Yeah, and maybe therefore... 10 or 20 or 30 times to really right. help someone work something through. So, I mean, one way to think about some aspects of psychosis, which are some are very profoundly biological, mm-hmm. but some aspects of psychosis may be the, the experience of a psychotic illness one dimension to it is that it is a terrible trauma for the person. Mm-hmm. 
and that one can modify some aspects of the trauma mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of having one's psychological life disrupted in this way we, we uh, did through techniques we've learned now to deal with other kinds of this trauma. This is NYU, a lot of the research on that and the yeah, consolidation. This is, this is Joe Ledoux's, Joe Ledoux's and work and, and, and his colleagues. Oh, good, good. We, so you we, have, <laughs> we actually we did a... Can we go to the audience if uh, you yeah. are okay? You want to sure, I just want to say one, one more thing. We actually did a conference, uh, ISPS, in Santa Monica about three years ago on exactly this topic. Trauma and psychosis. Yeah, I think it's a very, very important area. And Joe uh, is now working closely mm -hmm. with us, so this will be a chance to continue. Now, there's a lot of people downstairs, like 100. And some of those people, if they'd like to come up and ask some questions, should come up and ask those questions, because we are you got to come to the microphone. And that's the way to ask the question. And please identify yourself. If you don't come to the microphone, because everything is being recorded, you cannot be heard. So if you have a question, you must come to the microphone. We have a question. Lo and behold. I'm enjoying this. This is great. <coughs> Martin Silverman. I'm uh, training a supervising analyst at the uh, Institute um, affiliated with NYU Langone Medical Center and a clinical professor of psychiatry there. I was reminded by this of um, an experience way back when I was a medical student. I was a second year student. There was a coffee break time. I went down, picked up a New York Times, uh, which at that time had a science page every day. And there was a glowing article. Uh, that took up almost the whole page about a new medication that was going to transform psychiatry, perhaps eliminate the need for psychiatrists. With this pill, there would be no more depression, no more anxiety. It was Librium, which, of course, in its, in its, in its improved form, Valium became the leading prescription drug uh, addiction problem in the United States. That afternoon, I was wandering around in the library, because I love books. Um, and in the precursor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, which had the felicitous name, the American Journal of Insanity and Alienation, <laughs> um, I found an almost identical article approximately 100 years earlier for bromide, yeah. which eventually was removed from bromocelsa because it made people psychotic. I don't think we will ever have the good fortune to have a magic pill that is going to eliminate the need for psychotherapy. I think people with emotional difficulties will always need uh, a trained, uh, assisting um, other human beings to talk to. Uh, to help them with their problems. From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question. Yeah, Hi, Larry Amsel. I'm uh, at, at Columbia University. Um, I actually trained as uh, very much as a psychoanalytic, uh, trained with Otto Kernberg, and went and sought out that kind of residency program because I was very interested in psychoanalysis and spent most of my career in uh, thinking of psychoanalytically oriented things. But since 9-11, most of my time has been spent with 9-11 survivors in research studies um, on post-traumatic stress disorder. And what struck me was that the word psychotherapy is used to encompass things which could not be more different. Absolutely yeah. could not be more different. And when we have a discussion or argument whether psychotherapy versus meds, I think we have to get very, very specific for the PTSD. There was, I mean, there's no question, and this is, um, you know, both uh, in terms of there's published research, but my own personal experience was that the prolonged exposure technique was miraculous. I mean, I had trained as an analyst. I was totally into that. And then when we do these 12-week techniques for, pe uh, for well adults who have a trauma, I mean, it's, it's restricted to that. Well adults who have a trauma can remain very ill for very very long and then the first couple times I did it I thought it was you know it was magical prolonged exposure involves asking the patient who are completely resistant and you we, we have hour and a half sessions because you spend the first 45 minutes arguing with them to do it and the next 45 minutes doing it patients are very resistant to it to a going over with full affective openness the trauma that they went through 
Well, that's an old and, Freudian idea. <laughs> um, no, it's not. It's Freudian. very different. Because, well, well, let me just tell you what the distinctions are. The distinction is, that I, again, as an analyst, when you sit there and you have the patient free associate, they do not go because there's so much. The whole point is that they avoid these, uh, they avoid these memories. No patient on free association is going to do what my patients do. I have to give them four introductory sessions, and I have to push them to do this. This is so unpleasant, and yet it's so curative. But I don't think you're going to get to it. I think that I, I responded too quickly. Let me say I do think that psychoanalysis gets to this, but I think very slowly. No, I think it accidentally psychoanalysis gets, gets it. What I meant to say is that what you are doing was written up by Freud in Beyond the Pleasure Principle as the way as a way the mind deals with trauma. And so what he said there is that. For example, repeated dreams, anxiety dreams, have to do with the fact that you're continuing to try, and the mind is continuing to try and heal the trauma, and that it's important for it to be repeated because it does it naturally, and what you do is you make it more, you have it done during conscious waking hours as opposed to just in sleep. Let me just respond. Well, my patients generally say to me, you, you have to be crazy to suggest that it's going to be helpful for me to go over the trauma. My problem is that the trauma is haunting me. And I explain to them very much what, um, what Charlie said. That actually, and the, the metaphor I use is it's the difference between a Word document and a PDF document. Patients open up their <laughs> memories in a PDF document. It's immutable because they don't open it up with full affect. Oh, when you get them into this procedure, right. it's opening up as a Word document, and you can actually that's get some change in it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, I just wanted to tell a story. Um, I'm an artist. I'm not um, I'm a neuroscientist or uh, a, a psychiatrist. But I was involved in a, in a conference in Israel um, about 10 years ago talking about trauma and art. It was sort of the path, the path from trauma to art. And um, it was me and a whole bunch of mental health professionals, and I was really thought, in Israel, what am I going to, you know, this is ridiculous. But um, apparently, uh, there were warehouses full of people labeled psychotic in Israel who'd been there for like 50 years. And it was a big scandal when it turned out that nobody had ever asked them. They came to Israel after the war. They came somewhere between 1945 and 1948. And the scandal was that no one, no psychiatrist, no social worker, nobody had ever asked them, well, where were you before you came? And they all turned out to be Holocaust survivors. And nobody asked them if the source... I mean, and nobody even, it never occurred to anyone if, if, if the source of all of this was their Holocaust experience. Then, of course, after 50 years, what can you do to help them? In any case, what can you do to help Something. people? Holocaust, certain kinds of trauma. I mean, you know, and I don't, but I have a lot of friends who are analysts and who are involved in this stuff, yes. um, and who say that talk therapy is no good, like Bessel van der Kolk, and who uses body EMDR and body kind of work, and I mean, who knows? I don't know. But the point is, nobody even bothered to find out. They yeah. weren't really sarcastic. So I well, think they had one of our members, Story Lowe, uh, has yes. an archive up at Yale. Yeah, well, it was his conference. Center. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's, a, he's a member of our group, and he... Oh, yes. Uh, well, he's very good at yeah, yeah. whatever this is. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, just just to, uh, to to comment very briefly, thank you. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy what happened in the, in the case of these child Holocaust survivors because many of them probably are not truly psychotic. Exactly. And they are just deeply traumatized people. Well, one thing I would say, which is optimistic in, in the area I work in, which is severe repeated trauma, uh, where people can suffer for 50 years, that does not mean that they're not right. treatable. That's, That's right. something important to say. Uh, um, for example, oh, we... we uh, as we began to develop uh, more advanced treatments for the care of combat veterans within the VA system nationwide, and I was responsible for that in San Francisco, and we began to bring in the, the evidence-based cognitive behavioral treatments and better pharmacological treatments, uh, it was not at all uncommon to care for a World War... I'll give you a, 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 a case example of someone from World War II who'd been suffering... Um, combat-related nightmares for 50 years and uh, terrible other problems and um, had been um, uh, 
I have to be careful because this is all being recorded and there's confidentiality, so I can't give the specifics of the case. But just, just to say that when we care for people who have been brutalized even 50 years ago, that a course of, of uh, evidence-based treatment of 12 to 18 months can radically change their life even at the age of 80, 85. And one of the, uh, one of the things that we did do even is do marital counseling and marital therapy with couples in their 70s and 80s where one member of the couple had been brutalized 50 years before and the marriage had suffered terribly because of this person's uh, stress, anxiety, and depression, and addiction over 50 years. And even, even in a course of one year of marital therapy for couples in their late 70s and early 80s, major changes were made. So uh, people are capable of change. The brain remains plastic through life. The, the mind remains plastic through life. And I'm very optimistic about helping people at any time with the right kind of care. Right. Even, even psychotic people. Even people who suffer from delusions and hallucinations. I presented a case this morning of a woman who'd been psychotic for 53 years with 35 hospitalizations, 20 years of wonderful supportive psychotherapy from a Chestnut, Lane, Chestnut Lodge trained analyst. But he made the mistake of not inquiring into her preoccupation. Once he became aware that she had a preoccupation called Mary, and he asked that uh, she show him Mary, and the patient hit him. So he stayed away from ever asking about Mary again. When I heard about Mary, I said, oh, that's funny. How did Mary develop? And lo and behold, the story came up of how Mary developed 53 years earlier. And over the course of the year, we discussed Mary and all of her various manifestations. Mary went away, and this person who'd been hospitalized 55 times had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, you name it was fine. Returned, went back to her family, went back to her children, her husband, went to work, and for the next 25 years of her life, had a life. So even with very, very severely disturbed people who've been psychotic for decades, many decades, it's possible to understand and go off antipsychotic medication and live a life. So there's no question, the human being us, we are all incredibly resilient, if given the chance. And the real problem is that so many psychotic patients are loaded up with antipsychotics. Enough of my shtick. If I, if I can just comment yes, on one thing as well, yeah, though, please. because but I mean, that, that's a, it's a tragic story you tell. But I think, to me, what it, it highlights in some ways, our field has made many mistakes. And I think a lot of it comes from these assumptions that we have. And we feel that we have declared that you know this person is psychotic, so they're psychotic without inquiry. And it just right. seems to me the more we are attentive to to that inquiring process, not not just though in a, and of course in a personal way, but in testing out our hypotheses that they may be correct, but they may very well be wrong. Uh, just to, to follow on to what Seth says, you know, I speak to my friends in cardiology. In my career, I, I, I struggled very hard. I had actually wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon and was very ambivalent about going into psychiatry, made the decision, but remained very friendly with people working in cardiology and surgery. And I speak to them about, about our problems in psychiatry, the problems you're referring to. They said, well, look, don't be so despondent. 150 years ago, if a patient came into a, to an internist or cardiologist's office, they would have swollen ankles. They were diagnosed with dropsy. Now, what is dropsy? They had a specific diagnosis, dropsy, and there was a sp psychosis, and there's a specific treatment for dropsy. Well, it turns out there are 158 causes of swollen ankles, and they can be separately, uh, using modern uh, tools of, of medical science, they can be se separately diagnosed, and, and about 50 of them are treated radically different, and half the treatments for one condition are, are, will make the other conditions worse. And there many causes of whatever is called. Psychosis, but it is, psychosis funny. is dropsy. It is funny, okay. though, that the, yeah. that the dozen patients in my book all responded to an inquiring approach. I just want, I just want a different question but that relates to everything you've all been saying. Do you think there's less interest in individuals now than there was before? 
because all the psychoanalysis, everything had to do with one individual and another individual. Now we want to treat groups quickly, economically, et cetera. Do you think that's driving some of the imbalance? Because I think there should be a balance between the two. I, I think that uh, just at the top of my head, what I thought that relates also to why those patients were never yes. asked. I saw the film. I saw a lot of the films that Dory was uh, doing in Israel, and you could see the patient when the patient was asked about their history. They seemed to have been getting re-traumatized, and I think that's a part of the risk of the work, right? While you're accessing <coughs> before you can change the word document, you have to be very careful. Put your fingers on the pulse of their anxiety levels and self-esteem too, Indeed. and shame. And we we saw the patients with nonverbal, uh, you know, behaviors becoming very anxious. I think there's a, a lot of resistance to working long term individually with patients because of dynamics like that. The discomfort that the therapist feels, the discomfort. No one likes to feel like they're hurting people. Um, one of my patients I was thinking of last night, we had dinner together, and I was thinking of this patient who I was working with him. He started scratching his hands within the first three months of the treatment and arms, and I just felt like I, I've opened Pandora's box, and I'm, I'm not a very interpretive analyst. Uh, it takes a long time for that to happen. and. He was getting worse before he was getting better, and my impulse was to stop meeting with him individually. You know, it's just making him feel more anxious, more disorganized. However, something said, "Stick with it." Stuck with it, he recovered. I think. Really? Yeah. That's I think it's very hard to do this kind of individual work with traumatized or or psychotic. Patients. The word psychosis has so many meanings, as was just pointed out. They've wanted to drop it, right? Nancy Andreasen was uh, going to push to drop the term from. I just want to comment, though, on the, on the individual piece, because I don't know about it. All I know is I've just been interviewing applicants to residency programs because it's the season, and pretty much the 120 I interviewed, every one of them wants to be a psychiatrist because they feel it's the field of medicine where you can get to know a patient, Good. Yeah. where you can Excellent. spend time learning about them, the which is very hopeful and, and very exciting. So I, I think that that well, is the, the attitude people... Well, then the medical schools have to work with that. That's what people that. come into the field wanting. So. Okay, next question. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess in a way... Can you tell us who you are? Oh, I'm, I'm Michelle Press, and actually I'm, I have an appointment at NYU, and I've been teaching the psychodynamic psychotherapy course at and NYU. And she's fantastic, if I can just <laughs> put that out there. Everybody who trains here. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a psychoanalyst trained here at, at uh, New York Psychoanalytic and teach in the analytic training program. I mean, this kind of discussion brings up all sorts of, I was thinking, either it's a free association or a loosening of association. But a few things I was reminded of back in like 86, 87, when I was a resident at NYU, Bob Kanker was the chairman and we had our morning rounds. He was very upset. A patient had been restrained overnight who had become agitated actually at the, at the VA hospital. And he asked the resident, the bleary-eyed resident, well, what were you doing? He said, well, the patient was banging on the wall, waking everyone up. We put him in restraints and sedated him. He said, did anyone talk to the patient? And we wanted to say, oh, wow, two in the morning? What are you talking about? Ten other people to see suicidal watches. But I, I think people who enter psychiatry, certainly my colleagues in social work and, and psychology, I think, know this to be the case, want to know about people and individuals. I, I, I don't know that the idea is to throw medications. I think colleagues of mine who might work in facilities where there is no support for psychotherapy might end up feeling they have no choice. Never mind also the dri driven by the demand of patients. Let me get, get me to my second um, reminder. About two years ago, I was a reporter for a panel on analysis and medication. It's very important to the analytic community that they not uh, rule out the idea of medication for patients in analysis. And it was a big debate. Are analysts insensitive? You know, is their model too restrictive that they cannot hear the pain and suffering of their patients? In a sense, the panel was preaching to the converted. Already, clinicians of all stripes in the audience were saying, absolutely, you have to listen to the patient. Sometimes you have to talk. Sometimes you have to medicate or refer for medication. 
judicious use of this is important. So I think that, uh, and I was thinking the different forums, you know, in that room, I don't think there'd be any question that we'd be talking about talking and listening to patients, but to what extent do you, can you only do that and how much do you need to hear what is happening in, and this is where I get to the final thing, which is as, as an analyst, the transference, whether we interpret it, whether we completely understand it, but I think actually that can often guide a lot of our thinking with regard to do we medicate now? Do we lower the meds? Do we increase the meds? Do we interpret the dream? Maybe we don't interpret the dream. But I, I think that kind of clinical seasoning, it does take time. It's mm -hmm. incremental, both in our own training and in helping our patients. So that was my Thank thought. You. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next question. Hi. Uh, even though I'm wearing all black, I'm not a Lacanian, but my, my question... <laughs> my, What's your name? My name is Amir, and uh, hi. I, um, I've been studying for a long time. I just read this fascinating book called Modern Psychoanalysis of the Schizophrenic Patient by a man who uh, uh, recently died, Hyman Spotnitz. And this, this email about this roundtable interested me because I wanted an opportunity to bring this up with people who are interested in analysis. Um, why, uh, I think Freud talked about the narcissistic wall, right? We don't typically interpret to, uh, to uh, what people call pre patients or um, narcissistic patients because they don't, the assumption is, is that there's no psychic structure there to uh, lend itself to interpretive language. But uh, where is the research on the pre oedipal transference, or let's say the pre-object transference? Is that a question that's interesting to anybody at all? Sure. Harry Guntrip in Schizoid Phenomena, Object Relations in the Self, um, talks about this beautifully. And he talks about going back to the lost heart of the self and just sitting with the patient for a long period of time until the self emerges from the chrysalis it's been uh, ensconced in. Mm. So there's there's a great deal of literature about this, and most of us work with this in our conscious awareness. So the and idea is that the work of God, he's not known here. He's uh, near eight, uh, 90 now. Gaetano Benedetti. He formed our group in 1956, mm -hmm. a Swiss psychiatrist, with another Swiss psychiatrist, Christian Muller. You, uh, NYU, our university, published his collected papers back in 86. I think it's one of the best volumes on psychotherapy of people with psychotic disorders. He, he, he recently retired, Gaetano Benedetti. 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 Okay. Just to respond to your comment, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure the question is whether to try to provide insight or not as a yes or no, depending on the level of the person's development and vulnerability, but how to do so. You know, Fari Amini, who was mm -hmm. a prominent analyst and uh, directed uh, uh, the outpatient program at, at, at UCSF in San Francisco, used to say, you know, for certain patients, the most important thing to rem remember is don't, don't add insight to injury. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good. Uh, there, there, there's, like a, there's a fascination with insight, right? <laughs> there's a fascination with insight in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, but what about this um, idea of uh, an attachment and what to do with that on a counter transferential uh, level? Uh, that seems to have fallen by the wayside. No, you, you have to sit with it. But, you have to just sit with what develops. Be but, aware but, of but, your but, but on a less playful note, having listen very carefully to the cases are that you've treated. I mean, you have worked with extraordinarily vulnerable people. Sure. You are making very important right. uh, interpretations, but the nature of your relationship with the patient is that they feel that you are in an, an alliance with them Absolutely. and that your, your, your adding insight is not an injury to them. Right. It is not an attack on what they perceive to be a very fragile struck house of cards that could come down, right. but instead somehow you're in with them in, in some safe relationship with them, right. which allows them to hear things that perhaps they couldn't hear or tolerate hearing from others. So that's also a question, yeah. how to help a person who feels very threatened by a deeper understanding of their own psychological life to tolerate that in a way which is safe it is, is not a simple thing and not a thing I think which is either particularly well understood or well uh, trained in, in, in psychiatry training. Well, that's Bob, the art of Kanker. psychotherapy. Bob Kanker, I remember him uh, making a comment about uh, 
the patient is always testing the therapist and uh, the therapist, he used the metaphor of therapist sitting on the branch of a tree and the patient soaring off the branch and waiting to see how the therapist responds. I mean, the, the therapist will be tested in many different ways to see if they're authentic, but not fake, if they're, uh, you know, meaning what they say, if they're able to take the heat. And if you pass the test, I think a lot of neurobiologic changes take place besides the, what we know of identification, all the psychological changes mm -hmm. that take place. But there's definitely a lot of turbulence involved. Well, I also think Mark Hilsenroth has done some studies that show there are factors that differentiate mm -hmm. different psychotherapies, but there are also factors that are common mm -hmm. and that the most important common factor in any type of psychotherapy, nice. be it DBT, CBT, IBT, mm -hmm. It's the relational aspect of the uh, relationship. It's sort of the relational aspect of the diet. The alliance. That alliance is more. But certainly, certainly with very disturbed people, the relationship alone isn't enough. One has to inquire into the meaning to the person of these phenomena. But if to do that without the secure attachment, it's not good. It's a hard group to jump. You've got to fight into this group. Hi, my name's Elizabeth. Um, I have a two part question. Um, Why did you only come in the first day? Elizabeth Reed. <laughs> it's an my Brothers song. Anybody? Okay. Um, so my two-part question is, if there's any consensus in the room here, which spe training specialization today will produce the best talk therapist, whether that's a PhD, an MD, an MSW? Do you, what do you, what's, what's necessary and what will make you good? And then the second part question is, if I could ask you to make a prediction, who in the next 20 to 30 years, which training specialization will produce the leader in the field of psychology who will both make wow. the integration of the field and outline the most important distinctions within it. <laughs> well, I'm biased, so I can't answer that question. It has to be. <laughs> so it has to be psychiatrists, right? Because I'm training the future generation. So I, I, can't, I can't speak to that. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think Certainly, psychiatrists are at risk mm -hmm. of losing some of the stuff unless we pay attention to the evidence that we've been talking about today. I think that remains a real challenge for us if we want to continue and to keep psychoanalytic thinking, psychodynamic thinking in a medical school and in an academic medical setting. We've got to stay very close to understanding it. One, one thought about it, uh, which is another challenge for our field. I, I'm very optimistic. First of all, um, I don't see it in, in, those, in that kind of way exactly. I would ask the question a little differently. What's the optimal way in which so psychiatric social worker, psychologists and psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses and other mental health clinicians can collaborate to form the field of the future rather than which yes. discipline will, will emerge? But I will say there, there is a, there's something sobering in the history of psychiatry that we should pay attention to which is that as modern psychiatry moves closer to, to neuroscience and neurology, there is some risk that we can uh, be in, become an endangered species. You know, there was a time when the commonest cause for patients being in mental hospitals was a neurosyphilis. And once it was understood that neurosyphilis was caused by the spirochete and could be treated, uh, syphilis was no longer the domain of psychiatry, became the domain of internal medicine and neurology. And as the causes and treatments of uh, serious mental illness, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and others become more understood biologically, our friends in neurology are waiting to acquire this, this part of the market. So that, that's just... So, 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 so maybe the future is in neurology. The pa the, uh, just the quick... becoming endocrinology. Yes, the pa the patient makes the, uh, the clinician. Well, I think Charlie's point about neurology and psychiatry talk to what's a complicated area, that, that the brain is the mind is the brain is the mind, and, and it's how do we pass that out? Well, chemicals can help. They may ameliorate difficulties. Psychotherapy can help. It may ameliorate difficulties. 
And when we get Brian to finish writing his book, all this will become clear. <laughs> <laughs> I wish yeah, I had no had pressure, pressure, Brian. Brian, no pressure. no pressure. The future psychiatry will do that. He's the guy to look out for. Thank you. Hi, Alice Mayer. I'm a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst uh, trained at NYU I'm in private practice. Uh, a word that didn't come up that I, I've been thinking about is metaphor. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. I'm not even sure what question I'm asking about neurobiology or something. But I find when I work with these patients, I'm thinking of a particular um, girl that I, that I move back and forth all the time between the, the, the concrete, the abstract, the, the lived metaphor, the, the verbalized uh, symbolic uh, word. Um, I'm thinking in particular of a, a girl that I've been treating, a, a psychotic girl who's been several years in, in long-term hospitals, wouldn't take medication, anorexic. Um, one of the things that we discovered was that when she, in her second year of life, she developed asthma. And for a variety of reasons I won't go into, wasn't treated for seven months. So she spent seven months of her second year of life not being able to breathe. And one of her primary symptoms when she came to me was being unable to breathe. So, but, but it was... I find that what I'm struggling with is not just putting that into words, but actually living it out. This girl needs rhythms. She needs to take a breath. She needs to know when to take medication, how it makes her feel, coming to therapy, and, and the constant resistances and, and, and stopping, um, stopping dead, in it and, and trying to get her to breathe. And we go back and forth between talking it and living it. And I just wonder if you could comment about that. I didn't use the word metaphor here. I certainly used it many times this morning. Helping a very disturbed person to understand their own metaphor is one of the main things that we do in the intensive kind of psychotherapy that I do. Usually people don't understand that it's their metaphor. They believe in some concretized form of hallucination or delusion or God knows what else. But to already get it to the level of symbol or metaphor is a big advance in the psychotherapy of these kinds of people. But I find that not interpreting it alone doesn't work, where it works after 10 years of, well, of living it out in a variety of I, different I don't think it's good to separate. just interpret, but to try to understand the origin. Again, it's hard for me to recall exactly what I've said when, but taking a history of the development of these ideas, of the symbols, of the metaphor, of the concretized hallucinations or delusions is the key. You kind of act as if you believe just as the patient believes, but you take a history, and in the process of taking that history, you begin to establish a beachhead and set some kind of divide between the believed in perceptions and rationality. And then little by little, inroads are made, and the patient can change, neurochemicals change, and lo and behold, there they are. I mean, I, I think, think it's not... Qu your question, um, uh, you know, when you were speaking, you said in the next 50 years. You didn't say in the next 10 years. That's because the, the complexity that is involved in putting together the body, the mind, the brain is such that uh, whenever you are working, you're only working with a small part of the big problem That's that right. is in front of you. And so you, your case illustrates that. That's right. I'm uh, Richard Owen Fisher. I'm a student. And uh, something that goes along with that and, and, and establishing um, some kind of criteria for evidence for, you know, w w whether things work, is, is it possible that what we're working with, unlike uh, a stent opening up an artery, which most stents are going to be the same and most arteries are going to be the same, a lot of these patients are very radically different. And what both of you have talked about um, you know, having success with like waiting for six years for a dream fragment to leak out or talking about Mary, you know, going, th these are such different um, approaches to such widely different patients. Is there a way to construct a, um, a, a trial or a um, evidence collecting mechanism that is not something from the, the, the science side of medicine or the, the um, like, a, like the cardiology model? Is there a different model that can be created? For tracking change? And for 
Right. Another, instead of instead of working with, with the cardiology model of evidence and, 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 and proving that these things work, is there, another, is there another model that you can construct a study around? Our, our group has discussed this for years and years and years, like what measures should we be looking at? What we come to con conclude is to use various measures, to use the EB, you know, symptom reduction pans or whatever, and also looking at quality of life, which is increasingly being incorporated into psychiatric research. But narratives, a lot of our members, um, Michael O'Glaughlin, I think, is he here from the Delphi? There's a group up at Riggs, Austin Riggs Center, that are looking at phenomenologic measures. There's a group in Copenhagen that are doing similar ipsaity disturbance and looking at the quality of the sense of self and the sense of self in interaction with others. So those kind of measures of, uh, you know, phenomenologic measures are being developed and are being used. And, and it's interesting to try to combine them. And gaining public and clinical traction? More in, we see it more in Europe, the uh, research on that. Less so here, but some change taking place. I would, in answer to your question, I, I don't think the problem is almost so much of how to determine if someone is better, because we, we do know that we can measure things reasonably well now, such as relief from the pain of stress, anxiety, depression, or psychosis. We can measure, as you're saying, improvements in quality of life. We have some measures of how effective people can be in their love and work relationships. And those are fairly generalizable. What, what you're raising, which is very important, though, is that as, we, as our field advances and we develop more well-delineated treatments, there is, a, there is a danger, and I think you alluded to this too, of, of being, uh, sort of uh, holding too narrowly to a specific model of care uh, for, for a whole range of different patients. So there is some, there is some uh, uh, preliminary findings by David Moore and his colleagues from, from Chicago to show that the overly uh, rigid application of models of behavioral treatments uh, which are, are less sensitive. If one loses one's ear to the individual nuances of the person in front of you, then the, the application of behavioral treatment or other treatments is less effective than if you can flexibly adjust those models to some extent for different personality qualities so, or different life experiences. So I think the next generation, if you will, of manualized uh, psychotherapies for, for psychiatric illness will be more sophisticated in addressing individual differences. And that will still be able to, you can, you can deviate a little bit from the manual and have it still count for this trial group that you were Yes, on. it would not be, the, the manual itself would contain some flexibility in how one might be flexible in relationship to different qualities or life experiences of the person you're helping. Two more questions and then we will end. If there any, come. Hi, my name is Joyce Shenkine. I'm trained as a neuropsychologist. So I'm listening to um, the discussion about a metaphor of a patient. And I'm thinking about a patient that I tested who had a difficulty with employment, losing one job after another. And I had a father with the same history. The mother was the main supporter of the family. So I was thinking, you know, in a psychoanalytic approach, you might look into the family relations try to come up with um, some concept behind the difficulties. The, the, the thing is, loss of job is consistent with ADD, uh, you know, attention deficit disorder. And that was my hypothesis when I tested this patient. And she turned out to have had ADD. And it's genetic. It's probable that the father also had it. So medication would be the first line of approach. And then, of course, she was going to have problems from lifetime adjustment to failure, family dynamics. Um, related to the father, but the approach would be different once you understand that there's, um, you know, a, a, a neurological issue behind it. It's not just psychiatric. Again, you, you, you run into the problem of epigenome versus genome. 
There's a lot of researchers in Germany who are trying to spell out all the different subtypes of ADHD. I had to review an article for the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, which actually was an efficacy ran, uh, treatment study of ADDH patients. And they were uh, grouping them by different, it was very complicated. They had this scheme like ADHD with trauma, ADHD with migration because of migration from other countries, developing world. Uh, nations and all. So uh, ADHD is a, a heterogeneous group. Well, for sure, of, some of people, people even think it's a symptom or it's comorbid with so many other problems. Uh, but, but, you know, it's just the recognition that there is an underlying disorder. Well, but ADHD, what is, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It, it, it manifests in certain features of problems in attention, concentration, working memory, etc. Uh, so it's dropsy. Yeah, I don't mean to demean it. it it's a, uh, to be careful when I say these things. I, I don't mean to say that there hasn't been very important un advance. The concept of ADHD is very important. It's becoming better understood. The neurobiology is becoming better understood. But 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 ADHD is is not a is not um, a myocardial infarct. It's not a tumor. It is a be a complex human behavior. Which which can have 50 different causes. No, I, I agree. I, I wanted to say one, one other small thing about treating PTSD. The direction they're going now is to try to come up with biochemicals that will prevent the formation of the memory, which will traumatize the patient. So when you get people like at 9-11, instead of worrying about the post-traumatic care, it's like right away they're looking for, they, they have some chemicals now that they can inject into those people, um, irrespective of the ones who might be more susceptible to developing the syndrome. You know, just saying, okay, across the board, we're going to wipe this memory out mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry in the future. Okay. That, that last question. That, that's the topic of another panel. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Yep. My name is Constance Ohl, and I'm not a psychiatrist, a social worker, an analyst, any of that. First person we should listen to. No. <laughs> well, maybe so. I'm just Seriously. Wondering, because I wonder when people are in the wrong situation, as in Russia, when people were sent away and they were identified as being mentally ill. Yes. And when you see a patient, and I've not, perhaps I missed, but I have not heard anybody mention the environment that the patient is in. And how do you investigate the environment? So in the That's treating of people who are psychotic, you try to take a history and the history leads to understanding their family dynamics, the effect upon the person, if, okay. But I think that you don't really know. This is their opinion. This is how they see it. Everybody's right. wrong, they'll say, perhaps. Maybe everybody is wrong, you know, but how do you know? Well, and some, you sometimes, Sorry. sometimes you do bring the family in, but the important thing is what it's like for the person. That doesn't mean that it's true. But if the person develops certain kinds of symptoms as a result of seeing something a certain way, it's important to elaborate that and understand it. And sometimes, of course, you bring in other people, too, and then sort all that out. And how, what control do you have on that kind of a situation? Your own register. Hopefully you trust your own sense of what's accurate. But of course, that's subject to bias, too. Mm -hmm. This might not be directly related to your question about the environment. You said no one was mentioning the environment. I'm glad you mentioned it before we stop today, because uh, Again, I'm, I'm, go, I'm Chinese water torture. People in our group, uh, Jim Van Oz, who's a psychiatrist at the University of Maastricht in the, New, the Netherlands, a number of other people uh, in Europe primarily, are identifying social environmental factors, we call it the environment, that are implicated. Again, causality is an, an, uh, different from correlation, but implicated not just in the course and the outcome, but in the initiation of psychotic disorders. They have uh, researched many, many social factors. We've, the social psychiatry field in the States has waned. It's on the uprise a little bit. 
thanks to Leon Eisenberg up at Harvard. He's deceased now, but there are a number of good social psychiatrists here. But in Europe, it's always been important. It's retained its importance. And they have found a multiplicity of factors that are playing a role in psychotic disorders. Everything I mentioned a couple earlier, the migration of Afro-Caribbean people mm -hmm. to London has been studied in multiple yes. generations. But not only migration, but uh, urban birth, urban living, social fragmentation, mm -hmm. social defeat, social isolation, discrimination, poverty. I could go on and on. Do you know, but in, li in line with this, I think we should be aware of it more than any place else in the world because we have this idealism that we're supposed to all blend and meld. Oh, yeah. And so is that perhaps the reason we didn't pay attention? It was just oh. too much, you know, we couldn't deal with it. I don't know. It's I very. Yeah, my study is Probably cultural studies, yeah. and I find that very Thank problematic. You. Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.